Right, Psalm 49, we've got only one, one more week left in our Psalm series before we take a break and move on to another book of the Bible. Psalm 49 is, is an excellent psalm, kind of like the other 48 that we've done up to this point. It's hard to say that um, you know, any one of these aren't great in their own right. They all uh, are very unique, too, which is really interesting when you dig into the psalms, how unique they are. And, you know, I give, generally speaking, on, on Wednesday nights, I give, like, subtitles to the sermons I'm preaching on. It kind of gives a main theme. And for Psalm 49, I, I thought a fitting subtitle that I put up there is, uh, you know, hear this, all ye people people, which is the very first verse in Psalm 49 here, verse number one. And the reason why I think it's so fitting is because this, this particular psalm, it's a song, this particular psalm is geared and written for the whole world, right? There's many parts in the Bible, there's many parts in Scripture where, you know, it's written for people who are saved. It's written for God's people. It's written for people to understand, you know, some of the deeper things, some of the hidden mysteries, some of the dark sayings and things like that. This psalm, though, I think is a very evangelical psalm. It's, it's very, uh, it's, it's basically teaching basic truths, and it dovetails very well with the sermon I just preached on Sunday on what, what will happen to you when you die. Right? I just preached that sermon on Sunday, and it was very heavy on salvation, on what's going to happen when you die. And this psalm is similar in the sense that it just basically goes over kind of how the world's mentality, mentality is, how the world thinks about a lot of things, how they just kind of work for riches and get in, making a big name for themselves and everything else. But it's all going to come to nothing. Okay? And, and what really matters... And what ultimately, you know, we're, we're trying to get people to understand and we're trying to shine the light of the gospel to people is that you need to be saved. Amen. You need to put your faith in the Lord. You, you need to get saved because everything else, life is meaningless without the Lord. Without God, life is just, it's vain and, and completely worthless. You're going to end up just spending an existence here that is completely unfulfilling. At the end of the day, you may have some pleasures here and there. You may have some happy times, some sad times, whatever. But at the end of the day, when you really sit back and reflect, without God, everything just becomes depressing and vain and meaningless and empty. Okay, and that's the high level of this psalm. We're going to dig into it verse by verse. There's so much here. There's so many other passages that reinforce these same truths. But I love that it starts off. And again, we, I never want to forget, and, and you never forget as we go through the psalms, these are songs. Right? These are songs meant to be sung. Verse number one, Hear this, all ye people. Give ye all ye inhabitants of the world. Hey, everybody needs to hear this message. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, everybody, hear this. Hear this proclamation. Verse number two, both low and high, rich and poor together. It doesn't matter what state you're in. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how powerful you are. I don't care how poor you are. I don't care if you're homeless. Everyone needs to hear this message. This is for all people. Nothing should separate you from this message. It doesn't matter what status you have. Verse number three, my mouth shall speak of wisdom. Wisdom. This is, this is what's true. This is what's right. You want to have knowledge? You want to have wisdom and understanding? Listen to this psalm because this comes straight from the mouth of God. My mouth shall speak of wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. I will incline my ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. So basically what this is saying here, this psalmist in verse 4, I'm going to open up this dark saying of, of, you know, listen, get wisdom, hear the parable, and I'm going to open up the dark saying upon the harp. Because that's obviously they're playing music as they're singing this psalm. So they're opening up information through this psalm. Verse number 5, Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil? when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about. And for the saved, for the people who know God, for people who are trusting in the Lord, why should we fear? We have no reason to fear in the day of evil. Evil means there's something bad happening to you and there's trouble coming upon you. We have no reason to fear at all. 
because the Lord is our God. And we've already gone through, you know, that theme of the Lord being our defender, our shield, our trust, you know, who we can turn to in all of our fears. So I'm not going to spend much time on that verse. But look at verse number six. It says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. There's a lot of rich people out there. There's a lot of people with a lot of power and influence and, and are able to, to do a lot of things in this world because they have so much money and power and you know they can basically buy whatever they want. But you know what you can't buy? You can't buy your soul. No matter how much money you have, no matter how much, no matter how great and powerful you think you are, you trust in your wealth, that's not going to save you. And that's not going to allow you to redeem your brother. So Bill Gates, sorry, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care, you know, Elon Musk. I don't care, you know, name the top, the top million, billion, trillionaires, however much money they got in this entire world. I don't care. You could trust in your wealth, but none of you are able to pay the price to redeem your brother. None of you can pay the price to give God a ransom for your soul. It's not enough money for that. The price is too high on your soul. It, it's beyond the wealth and riches of this world. Verse number uh, 8 says, For the redemption of their soul is precious. And that word precious, if you just think about it, it, just, it means really pricey. It would be like priciest, right? But obviously we turn it into precious is the, the right word for that. It just means it's a very high value, very high price. It's very, very, very expensive. Your soul is extremely valuable. And don't forget that. The soul of every individual is worth more than any amount of money in this world. That's right. This is why we focus on souls. Amen. We're not worried about the physical things, the carnal things, the money of this world. Souls are way, 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 way more valuable. This is taught all throughout Scripture as well. Uh, I didn't have this in my notes, but I'm thinking back of, you remember when, um, when Abraham went after Lot to save him after that battle, right? And in so doing, you know, he was able to retrieve all the goods and everything that was stolen from the, you know, when they were sacked, when they were beaten in battle, and they were taken captive. And then the king of Sodom, who was representative of Satan, wanted to give Abraham all this wealth, but just leave the people unto me. He's like, no, 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 don't give me anything, right? Satan wants the souls, and he's willing to pay a high price for that as well. Satan was willing to give up, you know, what, what he's already been, you know, kind of operating under authority. He's, he's willing to give power unto Jesus Christ when he was on this earth, right? Look at all the kingdoms of the world. A moment in time, remember, he was tempting him in the desert. And say, I'll give all these things to you if you just bow down and worship me. He wanted control over his soul. He cared a lot more about that than all the rest of the riches of how important that was. The soul is extremely important. The soul is extremely precious. The redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever that he should still live forever in verse number 9 and not see corruption. Very obviously he's talking about having eternal life. Living forever, right? This is salvation. This is what you can get. But the price is extremely high. Uh, turn, if you would, keep your place here in Psalm 49. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read from you, for you from Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 26. Jesus said this, he said, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Again, just emphasizing the price of your soul. I was debating prior to tonight, I like preaching Christmas sermons, right, you know, right before Christmas, whenever that lands. And sometimes I'll take a break from doing a Bible study chapter. But I think that Psalm 49 is extremely fitting 
to give honor and glory unto Jesus Christ Amen. as we look forward to celebrating, you know, the birth of Jesus Christ that we recognize on Christmas Day. And this psalm does so perfectly, especially when you talk about the price of the soul. And then we look at the price that Jesus Christ paid and the precious gift of his soul, how he poured out his soul unto death for us. And the amount of love that's there to do something like that for that for us. And then to, to actually make the payment for our souls, the payment that we couldn't make with all of the, the, the riches of this world. All of that's too much for us, but Jesus was able to satisfy the price for your soul. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. The Bible reads, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. There's that word again, precious. Jesus Christ is precious. He's of high value, of high price. Verse 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, Again, there's that word again, describing Jesus Christ being precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. See, those of us that believe... Jesus is very precious. We recognize it as such. The unbelieving world, they don't, they don't treat Jesus Christ as being precious. That's why they'll throw out his name as nothing. They'll blaspheme. They'll, they'll, they'll use his name as a curse word. They'll, you know, means nothing. It's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They're offended by Jesus Christ. By and large. just the way it is. I mean, it's, it's kind of understandably so when they're not trusting in him, they're not, they don't have their faith in him, they're not believing that he actually did what he did, they're not, either not believing that he's real, they're not just fully trusting that and understanding of the price that he paid for them. And that's why we need to get the message out there and, and teach people about the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ that he paid for your soul. Your soul is worth more than anything. And people need to take stock and take and reflect on their own life and just think about... Man, what is going to happen to my soul when I die? Where is my soul headed? And the reason why it's so important, the reason why a soul is so valuable is because your flesh and your blood, it's going to die and it's going to pass away and it's going to come to nothing. It's going to turn to dust. That doesn't last forever. Your soul does. Your soul is going to continue. That's very valuable. Where you spend eternity, where your soul is going to be, should matter to you. And God doesn't need your money. And in fact, when you're born, you had nothing. And when you die, you're going to have nothing. You can't take any of your wealth with you. Take stock. Pay attention. What's going to happen to your soul? It's precious. But you know what? For as precious, for as pricey as your soul is, that's why Jesus made the highest price, paid the highest price that he could pay with his own life, with his own soul, with his own blood. He made the sacrifice for you. Flip back a, a page to, to chapter 1, 1 Peter. You're in chapter 2. Just flip back to number chapter 1. We're going to see the blood of Jesus Christ being precious. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by, the, by tradition from your Father. So he's saying, look, if you called on the Father... If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've called on the Lord and asked for salvation, he says, you need to, to pass the time of your sojourning. It's your temporary stay on this earth. 
Because once you've called on the Lord, you're saved. You call in the name of the Lord, you believe in your, in your heart on Jesus Christ, you are saved. You are saved forever. You have eternal life. Your soul has been paid for. It's been bought. You've been purchased with the price. So he's saying, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. We're only here temporarily. But he says, make sure you, 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 you spend that time here in fear. And we're talking about fear. It's not being fear of anything else other than fear of the Lord. Amen. And the reason why is because you need to understand the price that was paid for you. How, how much God paid for you. Man, you better watch how you act. Think about it. If you spend, think about how much money, you, the, the, the most expensive thing that you might spend on whatever. You get a brand new house or a brand new car. I mean, you spend a lot of money on that. If you only spend, you know, two bucks on something, a dollar on something, you know, you're going to be a lot more likely to treat it like garbage. Right? It's not worth that much to you. Who cares? You toss it around, throw it around, whatever. The more you invest in something, the more you spend on something, the more that you want to make sure, hey, watch it. You know, like, you get, hey, wipe your feet off before you come in the house. Right? You know, what, don't be brushing up and scratching my, the paint on my car or whatever. Right? People do that. Why? Because you're paying attention to something that you spend a lot of money for. God paid for your soul, which is more expensive than all the money in the world. You can't purchase your own soul. So you know what? He wants you kept nice and clean. He wants you kept the way that he wants you to be. He doesn't want you going around and, and screwing things up in your life and screwing things up in your body and screwing things up for what he purchased. Pass the time of your soul journey here in fear. Have that understanding from God's perspective. Hey, I, I spent a lot of money for you, right? I paid a high price for you. And for us, it's a free gift. Yeah. He did all the work for us. Amen. But how, how should we act? How should we respond? As his purchased possession, after we've received that free gift, you did all that for me? Right. You paid that high of a price for me? Maybe I ought to show some respect. Right. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. He didn't, he didn't pay some low price of just money. From your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers. Look at verse number 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. God incarnate. God in the flesh. God born of a virgin. God became a human being. Humbled himself. God in glory up in heaven decided to come to this earth. For you because all of that was involved in that high price that needed to be paid for your soul the perfect life sacrifice doing nothing wrong everything right obeying every commanded commandment be, being a servant to people helping others all the time praying Preaching, helping, healing, doing, having no home to call his, you know, to rest his head. Always focus on other people. To then be rejected and to still love. To be arrested and beaten and whipped and scourged and bloodied to a pulp and nailed to a cross and enduring all of that. God in the flesh suffering for you because the price of your soul is very high. So the price that needs to be paid is very high. 
Perfect, pure blood, precious blood being shed on the cross. Dying an agonizing death. And then not only that, his soul descended into hell. For three, and look, his soul descended into hell. The scripture couldn't be clearer about this. His soul descended into hell. Hell is not a good place to be. Okay, read the Bible from front to back, and it's clear. It's evident. Hell is never one time referenced as being a place that is not that bad. And in fact, in Acts chapter 2, it even makes reference that his soul was not left in hell. I'm sorry, but if hell wasn't really that bad, why would you worry about being left there? You wouldn't say like, oh yeah, you know, the persons went to Hawaii, but they weren't left there. Like, no, it's okay. I can be left here. Go ahead. We're, we're, we're good, right? I mean, you, go, you go to this great paradise, this great place. You're not going to say, oh man, yeah, I wasn't, you know, my, my body didn't see corruption and I wasn't left there. You know, my soul wasn't left there. Look, his soul wasn't left there because he conquered death and hell. But it's not, it wasn't a good place. He wasn't just, just, just hanging out there. Okay? Read Jonah chapter 2. Yeah. Couldn't be clearer. And, you know, Jesus Christ himself referenced, he said, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You want a little insight into what Jonah is talking about in Jonah chapter 2? Well, Jesus just pointed you there. He said, and he referenced it to him being in the heart of the earth, for him being in hell for three days and three nights. He said, yeah, just like Jonah was in the whale's belly, wink, wink, hey, you want to know a little bit about what's going on here, a prophecy about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the death and the burial and, the, and Jesus' soul going to hell? Why don't you try reading Jonah? Because Jonah 2 talks about the earth with her bars was about me forever. That wasn't just Jonah being in the whale's belly. No, the price that Jesus Christ paid was high in, e in every aspect. In all regards. Everywhere. Physically, spiritually, his soul, emotionally, every price that was paid was very high. Amen. Start to finish. And no, you know, we believe that there were all of those things were necessary to pay the price. The virgin birth was necessary. The perfect life was necessary. The crucifixion was necessary. The shedding of blood was necessary. The dissension into hell was necessary, as was the resurrection from the dead. He rose again from the dead. What is it but that he also descended first, is what the Bible says. Well, what's the resurrection except that he also descended first? It's all important. Amen. You can't just single out one and say, that's the only one that's important. No, it's all important. And you know what else is important? The sprinkling of his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. That had to be done too. You can't take any of those things out of the equation. There's a high price to pay, to pay for our salvation, for our souls. And Jesus paid that. Praise the Lord. That's why we're celebrating in a couple days the birth of a Savior. Remember that when you hang out with family. Remember that when you're giving gifts. Remember that when you're doing whatever it is that you're doing for Christmas this year. I love spending time with family, and that's great. And I, think, and I encourage you, and I think people should. I think it's great to give gifts. Just remember what's the, what's the purpose of celebrating. Right? Why do we give gifts? Because we're celebrating, right? Great, this is fun. I love you. I want to give you gifts. You give to you. you know, all the people you love in your family, give them gifts. Spend time with them. Fellowship with them. It's all important. It's all good. It's all means of celebrating. But don't forget what we're celebrating. Give God the glory. Give Him the preeminence. This Christmas in your life. Recognize Him. Talk about Him. And praise Him. Because he's worthy to be praised. Making such a precious, high price payment for your soul. 
Psalm 46 brought up, you know, the ransom, the rich people, the, the, the rich that trust in their wealth. They're not able to, to, to make a ransom for their brother because they don't have enough money to do so. Well, the ransom was already paid. The ransom for your soul. So it's already been paid. First Timothy 2, chapter 2, verse number 5, the Bible reads, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He's the ransom. Your soul is being held up because of your sin. Debt need to be, need to be paid. You need to make a ransom for your soul. You know what? Jesus paid that ransom for you. And it's paid in full, by the way. He didn't pay it partially. Once it's paid for, it's done. There's no more that you have to add on top of what Jesus did. Think about how much you're diminishing the price that Jesus paid when you say, oh, no, no, no. But, but putting my trust in Jesus isn't enough, even though that's what the Bible says. Putting my trust in Jesus and receiving the, the gift that he bought and paid for isn't quite enough because I still have to do my good part and my work and I have to go to church and I have to pray and I have to read my Bible. And, and that plus Jesus is enough to pay for my soul. It's like slapping God in the face. You think you're like it's like pulling out lint out of your pocket and going, "Here's what I got. Thanks. You know, I, I want to add this to the price that, that you paid for my gift." Like, get that piece of garbage away from me. The Bible says all your righteousness is like filthy rags to God. Okay? It doesn't even come close. You can't even put in a partial payment on your salvation. It's dirty. Jesus, what he did is enough. Just accept it. Accept eternal life. It's forever. Amen. Turn, if you would, real briefly to, to Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll go back to Psalm 49. There, there's, so, there's so much here, and I'm just going to read through some of these passages, just, just regarding the redemption price that, you know, that Jesus Christ paid. Luke chapter 2, very famous passage. Right? I, I, we read this every year, every Christmas, because it goes over the Christmas story. This is when Jesus Christ is brought, brought into the temple, right? And, and there's, there's two people, basically, that are prophesying about it. There's the old man that, that you know, was told by the Lord that he was going to not die until he'd seen the Lord's Christ, right? And then there was the prophetess. I'm going to read about the prophetess and what she said about how he was bringing redemption, that he was going to purchase our souls, right? The Bible says in Luke 2.36, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phineuel of the tribe of Aster. She was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all, that, that, to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So everyone looking for redemption, you want to be redeemed? She was telling about the Lord. And the Lord came. When Jesus Christ came, He was the Savior, the Redeemer of Israel and of the whole world. Uh, we went over this passage. That's why I'm not going to return to Romans chapter 3. Last Sunday, I went over just how the gospel is contained in Romans chapter 3, even just, just by itself. Romans 3, 23, I'll start reading for you for all of sin and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Jesus Christ is, has that redemption. Him alone, he's the only one that's able to redeem your soul. Hebrews chapter 
chapter 9, I had you turn there, look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. It's not a, well, today I'm redeemed, tomorrow I'm not, the next day I'm redeemed, the next day I'm not, back and forth, oh, I got saved, now I lost my salvation, I need to go back to church and pray again and get saved, and oh, wait, no, I sinned again, now I'm not saved. I'm sorry, it's eternal redemption. Amen. Once you're redeemed, you're redeemed. Amen. I mean, the thing about that word redemption, right? You see in the, the plastic bottles, or the, the glass bottles, right? There is a redeem amount. What does that mean? Five cents, ten cents, whatever it is. That means if you bring that bottle back, they're going to give you that price when they redeem it from you, right? They redeem that and you get paid for it. Once you give that bottle back, once they've redeemed it, you don't have it anymore to give back again and again. It can't get redeemed, 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 redeemed. It gets redeemed one time. Does that make sense, right? Your soul, it just needs to be redeemed one time yeah. by the Lord. Because once He's redeemed it, it's His. Amen. He's paid for it. You accept the free gift. He's already paid the price. He goes, boom. Now we belong to Him. It's like the song. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. See, we sing those hymns because they're packed full of good doctrine. Just like any good song ought to be. That's why as we're reading through these psalms, hey, this is the Word of God. Talk about great doctrine doctrine. It talks about redemption being eternal. Amen. We are redeemed eternally. You belong to God once you put your faith in Him. Amen and amen. You don't have to worry about it anymore. He's redeemed you. Amen. The price that was paid is sufficient. Psalm 49 Because that's what the people of this world are looking for, right? They want to live forever. But they've got a bad view on how to do it. Yeah. They trust in their wealth. They trust in their riches. They trust in other things. Oh, man. They're gonna be, they trust in technology. Yeah. Right? Like Walt Disney. He thinks you're going to get eternal life by, by being cryogenically frozen and then being able to, you know, in the future when mankind is able to, to achieve eternal life through machines and everything else and advancements that he's going to be able to live forever. No, you're not. In fact, he knows that already right now. Right, yeah. They're not going to be able to revive him again, right? <laughs> the only one who's going to be able to revive us again is Jesus Christ. But he didn't put his faith in him. Yeah. He has faith in man and technology and his wealth and whatever. And sorcery. That didn't save him. Psalm 49, verse number 10, the Bible reads, For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person, and leave their wealth to others. See, this is the warning to people who you know, don't trust in your wealth. Just think about it. Because what's going to happen, one day you're going to die. And all that wealth that you have is still going to be here. And that wealth is going to go to someone else. So if you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, this, this, this whole concept of leaving your wealth, you know, having great riches and leaving it unto someone else, how that's just vanity as well. It's still meaningless. So who cares how much money you get in this world? Ultimately, who cares? Right. It doesn't go with you. And we're not going there tonight, but you can read about the rewards that God gives out for how you live your life. And guess what? None of them are given for how much money you made in this world. Amen. He's not going, okay, well, you made a million dollars. Well, then I'm going to give you some rewards here, too. No, sorry. If, that, if that's all you got going for you, he's going to say, that burned up. That didn't abide the fire. That's right. Because right. that doesn't have eternal life. You, you know, that was your reward. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. Because you got nothing else. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 2, we're going to start reading verse number 14. The Bible reads, The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, As it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. So basically, what, he, what, he's, what he's getting to here, and as we're going to see as we continue reading, there's definitely a value to being wise as opposed to being a fool. Okay, but, but he's going off on this topic of basically one thing still happens to us all. Whether you're wise, whether you're a fool, and that's why earlier in the psalm he's saying, you know what? We're talking to low, we're talking to high, we're talking to rich, we're talking to poor, we're talking to fools, we're talking to wise. It's the same message. Everyone needs to hear this. And everybody needs to listen up. And he's saying, you know what? Just as it happens to the fool, it happens even to me. And, and you know, uh, um, Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, was the most wise person on the earth. God had given him extra wisdom so that he surpassed the wisdom of all the others that were before him. And he's saying, you know what? Same thing's going to happen to me. It happens to the fool. We're all going to die one day. No getting around that. Verse number 16 says, For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. He's saying, ultimately, you know, some people's name may be remembered more than others, but ultimately, in the future, it's all just going to be forgotten anyways. Right. People stop talking about you. Right. Your fame, your glory, ultimately is all going to pass and it's all going to fade away. He says, And how dieth the wise man? As a fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. He said, you know, and when you read all of Ecclesiastes too, you get the whole picture of what he's saying here. But you know, he did all these great works. He he built some great things and built gardens and you know all kinds of stuff, right? He he invested in all kinds of different things and made all these great projects and built all these wonderful works. But what he's saying is that no matter you know how much he's done, basically I end up just hating it because he can't retain it. He can't hold on to that stuff. And he's saying this is just going to go to someone after me. And look at what it says in verse 19. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yep. He's like, once it passes off from my hands, who knows what's going to happen to it? You take really good care of things. You maintain it. You want it to go. You're maintaining the temple of the Lord. But as you see, as it continued on and changed hands of, of who's responsible for it, it ends up going in disrepair. It ends up being forgotten. It ends up, oh, now we're going to rear up altars unto Baal, and who cares about the house of the Lord and everything else? And obviously, you know, the temple, just the physical temple, God didn't need a place built with man's hands, right? Um, it was symbolic. There's a lot of things with that, but I'm not going to dig too deep into that. But what, what Solomon's saying here is just basically, no matter how much work you do and you build all this stuff, it's just going to go for someone after you. It's going to go to someone after you, no matter who you are, whether you have a family or not. It's going to somebody after you. And who knows whether they're going to be wise or a fool. Yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Vanity means it's meaningless. It's empty. So who cares? You're going to spend all of your time here on earth spinning your wheels building stuff, laboring to be rich, everything else. It's going to go to someone after you and they may just squander it all and just come to nothing anyways. So who cares? But there are things that you can do that are valuable. Psalm 49, keep your place there in, in Ecclesiastes 2 because we're going to go right back to it. Psalm 49, verse 11 says, Their inward thought 
is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own name. So this is, again, going back to the world's mindset and philosophy on eternal life, those that have wealth, and they're saying, oh, I'm going to build these structures and these monuments, and I'm going to build a city, I'm going to name it after me. And as you read the Bible, you see that happening many times where, you know, people will start a settlement or they'll take over one and then they call it by their name. Right? I mean, we're even talking about the city of David. Right? It's the city of David. Well, you do that to try to, to, try to retain this, this legacy. Right? Because you say, we're going to call this by my name. But you know what? There's nothing to stop someone else later from taking it over and calling it by their name. Right. And then you know what? No one's going to remember the name it was before. Right. It's going to end up going by the wayside and being forgotten. It just happens through the passage of time. So no matter what great idea you think you're going to have for eternity, it's not going to last. And ultimately, how empty is that anyways? Your soul is going to be continuing forever. Who cares about the name of a city? I'll tell you what, I don't care about any of the names of any of the cities I've ever lived in and where I brought, was brought. I don't care about those names. I grew up in, 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 uh, in, in Burbank, Illinois, and Burbank is the name of a man. It's like Luther Burbank or something was his name. Some guy. I don't know anything about that guy at all. Apparently, there's some important guy who named, got a city named after him. Some small town on the south side of Chicago. Whatever. Right? To me, it just doesn't, doesn't mean anything. And eventually, it'll probably just become part of Chicago anyway. <laughs> Not longer have that name. Whatever. Doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's empty. And that person, you know, I don't think that person cares anymore about the city being named after him. Yeah. Yeah. Wherever his soul is. And I don't know where his soul is. I don't, I don't know anything about the guy who said that. If he's burning in hell right now, I don't think he really cares that he's got a city named after him. Or if he's rejoicing in heaven right now, I bet he still doesn't care that he's got a city named after him. Yep. He's either in a much worse place or a much better place. Either way, it doesn't matter. Right. Doesn't matter. It's, it's vanity. But that's what people strive for. They want to achieve this greatness. Let's keep reading in Psalm 49, verse number 12. The Bible reads, Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast's that perish. He's like, you know, and being an honor, either well-respected or well-respected and having a lot of wealth, you know, that it says that they don't abide, they don't continue forever. When it says they abide not, it means they're not going to live forever. They're like the beasts that perish. The animals that just die and are forgotten. Verse 13, this their way is their folly. So their way, the, their path, the road that they're on, it's foolishness. Why? Because it's not the path that follows the Lord. It's not the path of, of righteousness. It's just the path of the world. And it doesn't mean they're the most wicked people in the world. It's just their path is not right. It's folly. They're, they're, they're trusting in wealth. They're trusting in these other things. It's foolishness. It's vain. It's empty. It's not going to do anything for them. It says, yet their posterity approve their sayings, Selah. So the people after them, they approve of it. And, and a lot of people continue down that same path in that, you know, in that family or whatever. Verse number 14, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. So, you know, the, this is teaching something that's also found in Ecclesiastes 2 and elsewhere in Scripture. That wicked people who get a lot of wealth and gain a lot of riches ultimately are building up for the wealth of the righteous. That God is going to give those things in the end 
to righteous people. And in Ecclesiastes 2, we see the same concept. Look at verse number 26. It's that same passage that we're reading part of, but just a little bit further down. We just jumped a little bit further down. You could read it in context later at home uh, to read that whole passage about working and who's going to get my fruits of my labor after I'm gone. Is there going to be a fool? Are there going to be wise? You know, all that. Verse number 26 there, like the last verse says, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. So he's saying, you know, if you're this, this sinner, right, you're not, your soul hasn't been redeemed, you haven't put your faith in Lord Jesus Christ, you're traveling, you're working, you're heaping up, and all the treasures that you're heaping up for, you know what God's going to go turn around and do? He's going to say, okay, I'm going to give that to him, to the righteous. So what are you laboring for? You're not even going to be laboring for yourself. Why? Because the meek shall inherit the earth. Because there's going to be a resurrection of the just and of the unjust, but we're going to be resurrected and we're going to live and rule and reign with Jesus Christ on this earth. So all the riches that end up being accumulated are going to be distributed amongst God's people. And other people will have worked for that and dug it up and refined and whatever. And you know what? It's going to go to God's people. So why are you spending so much time being focused on the wealth? Right? Just one more reason why it's vanity. Back to Psalm 49. Look at verse number 15 there. The Bible says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. For he shall receive me, Selah. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. So don't worry about the people who, who accumulate all this wealth and power and stuff. Because when the glory of his house is increased, it says, for when he dieth, he's not taking any of it. It's not going with him. His glory is not going to descend after him. I'll, and I'll tell you this much, you know, the people who had all this power and prestige in this world, when they die and go to hell, no one's impressed by that person in hell. Even when Satan is cast down into hell, you know what people are going to say? Oh, you? So you're the one that instilled fear in, into, the, into the lives of people on earth? You're the one that, that everyone was so afraid of? It's you? And they're going to disdain him. And he's going to have no power and prestige. You know, Satan doesn't rule in hell. He never has. He never will. You know, in, in these, these, these tough guys, oh, well, I'm going to be ruling and railing with Satan in hell. You're a fool. Yeah, right. You know, you want to sound tough and everything. You say, oh, yeah, that's where I'm going. That's where I want to be. I'm going to be with all my buddies in hell. Look, your buddies, if they're already in hell, they don't want you there, right. yeah. first of all, because yeah. it is a real place. And just like the rich man in Luke 16 that died and went to hell, he was worried about his brothers. He said, I don't want them coming to this place. He didn't want to be comforted by seeing his family there because he didn't want them being the same torture that he was in. Nobody in hell wants people that they know in hell with them. Right. Nobody does. And nobody who's in hell is ruling or reigning. Because you know who rules and reigns over hell? God. That's right. The Lamb. They burn in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's right. God's the one in charge of hell. God's the one in charge of heaven. God's the one in charge of all of creation. Yeah. Don't be deceived by the foolishness. Verse number 18. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. And this is just a really interesting statement. It's true. But they're talking about this, you know, again, the context is these people who have a lot of wealth, they're trusting in their wealth, the way that they're going, they're, they they are focused on that. They're focused on their posterity. But basically, this is saying, don't be afraid of them because they're not going to carry anything away. But it says, while they lived, they blessed their soul. They speak well of themselves. You know, when people accumulate a lot of wealth, oftentimes they become very proud and full of themselves. And they'll, they'll, 
they, they make mention of themselves. And they will like sounding the trumpet if they're going to give money anywhere because they just want people to love them. And they bless themselves and talk about how great they are. And I mean, th this is going to continue to come up probably even past when, when there's a new president or whatever. But it's just any time you hear anything, you talk about, you hear about someone who's, oh, I'm the best one. I'm the best at this. And I, no one's ever done anything greater than me. You know, talk about pride. Right. It's just epitomizing pride. I, I don't see how anyone can look to that as being someone you want to lead you. It's disgusting to me. Yeah. It really is. And look, I'm not a Democrat, okay? And I'm not a Republican. Amen. I just call it like I see it. And I see wicked people, I'm going to call them out for being wicked. And you know, the pedophile isn't any better. That's right. The, the little girl sniffing pedophile, <laughs> who probably is going to end up leading this country, he ain't any better at all. <laughs> okay, so I'm not saying that he is. I'm just saying they're all wicked. That's right. I don't even know. How did I even get off on that? <laughs> oh, they blessed their soul, right? They blessed his own soul. They have a lot of wealth. Oh, I'm so great, right? Look at all the great things I did. They blessed their soul. And you know what? Men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. Isn't that weird? You do all these good things for yourself. You do these things for yourself. And then people praise you for it. It's kind of a, it's kind of a weird thing to me. But it's true. Men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. There's not, there's not often a lot of praise when you do well to others. But see, doing well to yourself is the exact opposite of the Christian life. Jesus came as the example to serve others, to be a minister unto others, and that's what we're called to do. We're called to, to be self-sacrificial as Jesus was self-sacrificial. He didn't do things... To, to honor himself. He didn't do things to do well to himself. When people wanted to make him king, he didn't be like, yes, yes, make me king and lift me up. And do, you know, He didn't do that. He gave us the example of saying, no, no. He went to his disciples and girded on the towel and washed their feet and dried the feet with the towel that he was wearing. That's what he did to give us the example. And you know what? The men of the world, they're not going to praise someone for doing that. They're going to look at them going, look at this chump. That's how the world thinks. Like, I'm not going to do that. We don't care what the world thinks. Amen. We care what God thinks. That's right. Because he'll be the one to lift you up. You humble yourself. You make yourself low, make yourself with no reputation like Jesus. Let him lift you up. Let him give you the glory and the honor. Yeah, you want to pray, get praise of the world? Go ahead, do well to yourself and let other people see it and everything else. And Oh yeah, you're so great. Because that's going to be here today, gone tomorrow. Do you want to live like Jesus said to live? There's something of eternal value. Let's keep reading here, verse number 19. We're almost done. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Now, that's a profound statement there. And it's easy to read over stuff like this when we're just reading or doing a Bible reading. But don't skip over that. Never see light. When people die and go to hell, there's no more light for them. Yeah. Right now, hell exists in the center of the earth. And you might think in your mind's eye, you think about hell, you think about fire and flames, right? I do. We're used to seeing fire in a campfire outside somewhere, you can, and, and you can see the light being, being given. When you're inside the heart of the earth, there's no light. You want to talk about darkness, we probably, I don't know, I bet no one here has experienced darkness that dark before. I mean, you, you try, there's so many little lights and stuff in this world, and, and if, you, if you've ever spent time, like, kind of keeping yourself enclosed somewhere in a room, in a closet, a house, or whatever, and you let your eyes focus for a long enough time, 
you always end up seeing some little tiny bits of light that are creeping in from somewhere, right? It's not like that in hell. And that's even worse because you're, you're going to be feeling, you know, these souls are feeling the flames of hell and seeing nothing. You wouldn't be able to see anything in front of you. It's so dark. And even when hell is relocated to the lake of fire, I'll just read this for you. Out, it's called outer darkness. The Bible says in, Ma in Matthew 8, 10, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer, outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is not a place to be laughed about, to be mocked. People who are burning in hell, the Bible says that there's weeping, right? So just serious, crying, sobbing, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. There's, there's anger and just, and just that, that, that extreme pain and emotion and bitterness and darkness. I mean, imagine never being able to see anything ever again. And just experiencing pain. That's hell. That's a little glimpse into hell. That's why this psalm is so important. It's why our job is so important. That's why, you know, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ is so important because people are literally going to hell every single day. They're literally going to hell every single day. It's easy to put it out of your mind. It's easy not to think about it. It's easy to think about all the good things and all the nice things and all the comfortable things in this world. But people are literally dying and going to this place every single day where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and burning. And in many cases, if they would have just heard somebody tell them the truth... And tell them the love of God and explain to them what Jesus did for them, they wouldn't have gone to that place. No one else is doing this job. Are you thankful for the price that Jesus paid for you? Are you thankful for that? Do you give regard to that high price that he paid for you? Then why don't you tell other people about the high price he paid for them? Because they're just as valuable as you were. That's right. yeah. You're so no better than anyone else's. Amen. He paid the same price for them. The least you could do is let them know about it. <laughs> Try to do what you can to help people avoiding going to that place. Because it is real. And I know it's not comfortable thinking about it. But we have to think about it. That's right. When you start getting too comfortable at your house and your nice place and you're going to heaven and everything's set for you, why don't you consider somebody else? That's good. Why don't you humble yourself a little bit and, and love other people a little bit enough to go out and be a servant to them? Who cares if the world mocks you or ridicules you? And don't expect them to be patting on your back and telling you how great you are. It's not about you. That's right. That's right. Amen. Last verse. Man that is in, in honor and understandeth not is like the beast that perish. So the psalm closes out. Someone that's held in honor, someone who has a lot of money, wealth, influence. But they don't have the understanding. They don't have the wisdom. They don't understand salvation. They don't understand the redemption. They don't understand eternal life. And they're just focused on the things of this world, just like the animals that die. They're here today, gone tomorrow. Their soul is going to be in hell. But no one's going to remember them. Whatever it is that they've got planned up and thinking that, that is, going to, is going to be you know, giving them their eternal life in whatever form they think they could get it, not going to last. Not going to last. There's only one place to receive eternal life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He bought and paid for that gift for you. If you're not saved today, get saved today. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. He loves you and He wanted, he wanted you to go to heaven. So He paid for all of your sins. He paid the highest price that could be paid. 
You can't afford it. You can't pay for yourself. Accept that gift. Best gift you can accept this Christmas. Accept the gift of eternal life. It lasts forever. All you got to do is put your trust on Him. Tell the Lord that you're trusting in Jesus Christ. He saves your soul. And you're redeemed. And you're redeemed forever. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for that sacrifice that was made, for that precious gift. God, for, the, for, for you allowing your, your only begotten Son to go and, and be sent to this world to, to face the death and the death of the cross, Lord, and, and to um, allow Him to bear the burdens and the sins of the whole world and, uh, and just everything that was done, Lord. We, we thank you for loving us so much. It's hard to understand. It's hard to comprehend how, how such love is even possible, Lord, but we love you because you first loved us, and, and um, we're so thankful that, that you did. God, help us. Help us in our, in our weak, sinful state to show the honor and respect unto your name and, and to you for what you've done for us, Lord. And I pray that you would please help use us, these weak vessels, to be able to go out and, and lead other people to Christ and to to show them how to be saved. And, and God, I, I, we're here for you. We love you. We want to serve you. Lord, guide us, direct us, help us to walk in the light and that you would just illuminate our path for us. And uh, Lord, thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.